Hello and welcome to Tiny Desk Knitting with Emma. Um, today I'm going to talk about a single breed sheep yarn and a project that I'm knitting with it and the very um, long and arduous process of getting to the right pattern for this wool. Um, today I'm wearing my Soldotna crop. I have made this a bunch of times, but this is the only one I've ever kept. Um, I've made like four or five times for others as presents, people who really like it, my friends, etc. I made one for my uh, my neighbors growing up, two girls that I grew up, uh, well, next door and then across the street from. I made one for their mom once. Um, and uh, she loves it. I made one for my friend Jennifer. I made one for my friend Elizabeth. I think those are the four that I've made. Yeah, it's a, it's fun. It's cute. It's cropped. I, mine's not super cropped, but it's it. I, I make them in sock yarn because um, as long as you, I just like go up. I mean, I check the gauge. I'm careful. Um, and then usually have to, because of the gauge that I want, I usually have to go up a size. So this is actually up two sizes. This is the large size. It's quite oversized. I love it. Um, it's a little cropped. I usually wear it with like over something or with like a higher waisted skirt or shorts. Um, sometimes I wear it as a crop top. I'm just not usually that kind of person. Um, but I appreciate people who are. So let's talk about the yarn first. So this yarn, Wensleydale Long Wool Sheep Shop. Pure Wensleydale, 100% Wensleydale. It is, this is 100 grams. This is an Aran weight. So I got this from Wensleydale Long Wool Sheep Shop. I ordered it from England more than, I don't know, coming up on three years ago. So this cute little logo, I love their logo. It's so cute. Wensleydale sheep produce the finest and most valuable luster long wool in the world, spun in England. It is Aaron weight. There is 174 yards, 160 meters in a ball, obviously hand wash only. Does this say the color? No. This says some information about where you can find them. They have a website, I will link it. Um, you can, I remember, when I got it, you could get Aaron, DK, and Fingering. Maybe they even have a chunkier one. Um, and I got, okay, so this was, I think it was, it was before COVID. I think it was like not that much before COVID. It was like a couple of months. It was like around Christmas time. And I ordered it from England and it wasn't super pricey. Even with the shipping, it was like, you know, it was a pretty reasonable price. So I was like, all right, I want to try that. I wanted, I was kind of the beginning of my, like, I really like woolly wool. I want to know what this breed is like. I'm interested. At the time I was knitting a lot of yoke sweaters. And I think that I thought I was going to use this yarn for yoke sweater. So I got, I didn't really, I should have gotten more of them. I got five of this color and I got one of this color. I've used part of it. So I think this is called Mizzle and this is called Dusk. If I'm... I'll check and I'll put it in the notes down below. Um, but I got this to be like the contrasting color. It's actually not that contrasting. I mean, it kind of is. Um, I think it's because the yarn is so shiny that like if you knit it up, like actually in color work, it might not be super high contrast, hard to say. Um, I'm, mm, where do I want to go next with this? <laughs> so yeah, I didn't, I didn't really know what Wensleydale would, would t feel like because I'd never like thought about single breeds before or like done that exploration. I was really surprised when I got it and I touched it and I was like really, um, it's it feels really soft when you're touching it. It doesn't always feel soft on your skin. Um, I talked a little bit about Wensleydale in a few episodes ago. Um, so I had my my episode about the blue Aldous sweater that I was working on and then the, the following episode I had finished it and I was wearing it the blue sweater in the yarn was called Titus by Ba Ramu. And Titus is a mix of long wool, uh, blue face luster and Wensleydale. I can't remember if I said there was another one, I would have said it in the episode and um, alpaca and it's finger. It's well, it's more like a sport weight. It's actually similar to the one I made was similar to this color. It was kind of like if you mixed these two colors was the color I made. Um, and that had been a gift from my best knitting friend, Monica, a couple years ago for my birthday. So I knit that into that Aldous. And like I said, it's, it's really warm. It's quite warm. It's quite, um, shiny. The staple is so long. It's just like, 
it's a gorgeous yarn to knit with. I mean, it depends on what you like. It's not super springy. Um, if you watched my last episode, I talked a lot about the spring and the blue face luster that I had gotten at Maryland Shape and Wool, um, which surprised me because that's also a long wool. So Wensleydale is a super long staple of wool, like famously. So I'm going to uh, have my handy dandy fleece and fiber massive source book here. Page on Wensleydale. Part of, it's part of the English long wool family. Um, so when, this is kind of interesting. It's the only breed that can, it may be the only breed that can directly be traced to one single ancestor. And it was um, bred in 1839. There was a New Leicester ram and it was bred with a mug ewe, which is an old type Teeswater ewe that didn't show much of the New Leicester influence. So Teeswater and Wensleydale are very similar. Um, so yeah, he, he was primarily used for bre this, this guy, this little guy that was born. Um, his name was Blue Cap because he had blue head and ears that show up as a recessive trait in Leicesters from time to time. And Blue Cap was bred with a lot of Teeswater ewes. And so he, you know, the, the Wensleydale sheep, um, originated from breeding specifically Blue Cap <laughs> with a bunch of Teeswater ewes. And Blue Cap was, again, he was half Teeswater and half New Leicester. So he's three quarters, he was three quarters Teeswater and one quarter New Leicester. Yeah. So this says, um, there's a bunch of information about how close Wensleydale fleece is to Teeswater and the sheeps, how close the sheeps are. Um, statistically, they have nearly identical wools, it says here. Um, and it's likely that their fibers handle similarly in industrial situations. Yet to a hand spinner, there does seem to be a subtle yet definite difference between them. So the wool hangs in distinct curly ringlets and doesn't felt well, has no Kemp. Kemp is like, um, I think Kemp is that, that like, white kind of wiry hairs that are sometimes found in like a you notice it the most i think in the in the hebridean wools that you see like the little white hairs sometimes i think that's what kemp is somebody can correct me if i'm wrong i will look it up and i'll put something about kemp in the show notes um the wool's uniform throughout the fleece because of the length it's a super long staple length um low twist yarns work really well and there's something about their colors but i'm just going to show you this page so there's a picture very curly very curly oh it's so cute and here's a bunch of the examples so those are the clean ones you can see how long they are it's super long that's one staple you know there's some pictures of the spun wool a couple of swatches you can see there's a real halo around this and when I show you um this this knitting you will notice that that is true okay so done with that um, okay, so I got this yarn. I often get yarn and it takes me a long time before I do anything with it. Um, that's just who I am. I'm like, oh, I get it into my head that I need it and it sits in my stash. I used to not be that person. I used to always only buy things if I had a project in mind and I would only buy yarn if I was ready for a new project. And then lots of people will say, this is how I got crazy. And you know, you just kind of go off the rails. <laughs> um, so yeah, I have a lot of sweater quantities. This has been in my stash for so long, you know, almost three years. So I decided, again, this is kind of part of my sweater stash down. I think I showed this in the um, original video, sweater stash down, which I think I did in February, January, around then. I don't know. So it was sometime. I think it was in February. Um, and uh, I'll link it. It'll be in the show notes. Um, I had gotten out, basically I was just decided, you know, like, let's have a, like, let's have a stash down and knit some of our like old stash yarns that we've had for a long time that are really special into beautiful sweaters so that we have the beautiful sweaters and that we can make room in our stash for more sweater quantities because let's be honest, sometimes it just takes a little bit of a push to do it. So I decided to challenge myself and I got out I mean, I have this, these yarn cubes in the basement. If, if There were some episodes again, like January, December and January, where I was actually sitting down there, but I can't sit down there anymore because the um, dust in the basement really makes my lungs um, not happy. So I actually have to wear a N95 in my basement now. Um, but my yarn's still down there, and it seems to be pretty clean. It's getting warmer. Um, I'm keeping a really close eye on, you know, the bug situation. If we 
see a lot of bugs or moths, but we haven't really seen too many in the basement. I've seen a couple of spider nests down there, but not like even close to the yarn. Like it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty surprisingly clean down there. I'm planning on getting, um, you know, Ziplocs and band bands and bins like those bins with like airtight lids. Um, if for some reason, uh, there's an emergency. Um, I do have an airtight bin for, I don't know if the lid's kind of cracked, but it's under my bed and it has like my less active whips in it. Um, just so that they're not just like, I find it under my bed. I keep, that's where I keep my whips and um, they just like they're in bags and they just kind of get everywhere if I don't keep them in one spot. So I like to keep them contained ish as much as I can in that little bin. I also have some of my sweaters under there. I have like my fair isle sweaters under my bed because like I'm really worried about the basement flooding because we're technically below sea level, I think. Um, and there's some sweaters that um, they'd probably be okay in the Ziplocs because um, most of my sweaters are in the in vacuum packed bags, vacuum seal bags. But the um, the fair isle ones, I really don't want to get damaged in a flood. Um, even though we have renter's insurance, you can't replace a hand knit sweater. Um, so I digress. It's been like 11 minutes and I haven't even shown you what I'm working on. This is so typical. Um, okay. So let's talk about the journey towards this sweater. Um, so the first thing I decided I thought I would do with it was I thought I was going to do the nurtured sweater by Andrea Mowry, um, which is beautiful. It's a bottom up raglan sweater with, um, with this really nice texture pattern on the front that's just made with slip stitches. So if you're looking for a fun pattern, apparently it's great for hand spun. Um, it's like a worsted air and weight pullover, a little simpler than just stock and net, but not too hard. Um, so I started with that, but I modified it to be top down because I didn't know if I would run out of yarn. I think I would have been fine. I should have done it bottom up. I probably would have finished it that way, but I didn't. Um, and because of the long wall, okay, so you can see that there's a, it is a loose twist. It's a very loose twist. It's easy to kind of split the fibers because the twist's so loose. There you can see. Yeah, it's easy to split. So I don't know, the slip stitch thing was just kind of sometimes that they would break and I was getting a little frustrated. And I actually got pretty far in the sweater. I really had to work hard to modify those short rows at the top because it, uh, it messed up the texture pattern. And then when I had some other when I joined it, it was complicated and basically it was weird. Um, but I made it work. I don't think it was noticeable, but then I don't know. I just like got disheartened and I was like, I don't really want to knit the rest of this. And the reason is because there was too much purling. Like I think I really like the nurtured sweater and I really like the stitch pattern and I think I would like to make it, but I would make that in pieces and sew it together because I would like to prefer to work it back and forth because it would be a lot more, um, be less purling involved yeah so um almost no purling involved in fact i think very little regardless that's that's the plan i think i might try it again but do do it um do it back and forth at some point with a different yarn so then i, I ripped it out and I cast on Fort by Jared Flood, except that was also a sweater. In, well, that was in pieces. And I was like, I'm going to do this as a top-down raglan. Same thing I said about Nurtured. That was going better. Fort is beautiful. If you've never seen it, it's a beautiful pattern. I made it, I did make it last year in Briggs and Little uh, Regal. And it is just a textured sweater. It's like a checkerboard, like two by two, like a tiny basket weave. Um, I did make it in pieces and sew it together. It looked great. It fit the recipient. Um, made it for my... My friend Ralph, Ralph was the uh, faculty director of the college house where I lived in graduate school. And I made Ralph a sweater and I made Ralph's wife, Elena, a sweater. Um, and they're really, really nice. Um, and I, yeah, I made that sweater for Ralph and it looked great fit him. I really liked the, the um, stitch pattern, but I always kind of wanted to do it top down raglan. There's only one issue you, you just have to be careful if you're modifying a stitch pattern like that because I was doing it back and forth for the back of the neck and then I joined it. So you have to be careful what round you joined it on, how many you cast on for the neck to make sure that the stitch pattern lines up. And then once you get to a certain point, mm, that point when you're casting on stitches like that, if you do it this way, which I did, you have to then there's like a section of the sweater where the stitch pattern is going to be off. Again, it didn't matter that much with the Wensleydale because 
this yarn does not have very crisp stitch definition. It's really drapey. Um, it's a long wool, so it's it just kind of hangs. It has it's and it's worsted spun. This is like a, a, a characteristic of yarn like this. It's really drapey, hangs really well. Um, doesn't super well show the texture patterns. And both of the sweaters I was attempting to make had texture patterns. And the fort was just kind of sitting, and I saw it at some point, and I was like, oh yeah, I don't really feel moved to work on that. Um, and sorry, I just paused it for a second because I had to sneeze. <laughs> Hopefully that was only a one sneeze. Usually I sneeze two or three times. We'll see. Um, but anyway, I got it into my head like, I don't know, I was, it was downstairs and I put it in a bag and then I got it out to like put it away. And I said, I don't like this. And it was like, legitimately, it was like 1030 on Wednesday night and I should have gone to bed. I had just been at pub trivia. I had had a really good time. It was fun. Got home, wanted to edit some more. <laughs> like this is me. I'm, I, sh I know I should go to bed at 1030 after pub trivia. I just never, I usually go to bed around 11, but I actually did okay. I didn't, it wasn't crazy. Um, before I cast on either of those other sweaters, I did see something that I really wanted to make with that yarn specifically. This is actually not even the, that wasn't even the first time I tried to knit with this yarn. The first time was I tried to knit Lakeland from line of four for Brooke, who's the mom of the kids I used to nanny. Um, and it just didn't, it was like the gauge just didn't work with the yarn. I don't know, it was too loose. I ended up using a Brooklyn tweed yarn that was indigo dyed that I got on a sale and oh my gosh, it made my hands blue every single time I knit with it. It was hilarious. And so Brooke has to be careful when she wears it to not wear like anything underneath that's white because the indigo dye will get all over it. Anyhow, then it was in this edition of Lina, Lina 11, which came out approximately a year ago. And it was this one on the front, this cardigan, which is called Visiting and it's by Stella Ackroyd. And I'm gonna show you, so this, I just saw it and I was like, that's just really like a perfect piece. So it comes in a pullover and a cardigan. So this is the pullover. Gorgeous. The models in this are so pretty. Um, visiting. And then the cardigan. So here's a close-up of the texture. Gorgeous. And then here is the cardigan version. And it's just really nice. It says, Stella Ackroyd's designs are elegant and timeless classics that are achievable for knitters of every level. She concentrates on making the pattern instructions easy to follow. I know how frustrating it can be to have a mid-project crisis, so I try to make my designs enjoyable right up until the final cast off. Um, she wanted to create a perfect all-rounder, the one piece you would take for a weekend away. She lives in Northumberland. To her, knitting means challenge, creativity, and achievement being able to create a beautiful piece of contemporary knitwear using traditional techniques and materials. Um, so your buttons on with a single ply of the main knitting yarn. This gives your garment consistency. That's a good tip. The visiting sweater and cardigan have a high v-neck for warmth and the semi-shawl collar for snuggle. So let's see what the yarn is here. Okay. Uh, this is just the, the specs page. So I'm not gonna show you a chart, but there's the... the uh, illustrations which are fun so you can see this is a it's wide it's a drop shoulder it's got a v-neck um yeah it's it's not super long so it's not long the the whole thing is like from the length from the underarm to the hem is only like it's about 12 inches um this is meant to be worn with some ease it says eight to ten inches i didn't make a size for that much ease but i think um, that it's going to end up having about 10 inches of ease because of the, it's just a little Wensleydale again, because it's a long wool, it has a ton of drape. Um, the, the gauge for this is 19 stitches and 25 rows to four inches. I didn't even check. Um, I just went down one needle size and I thought this is going to be roomy. It's going to fit. Don't be like me. You should check your gauge. I, I mean, I had swatched with this yarn like two or three times already. So I kind of knew what I was going to get. I didn't swatch in the stitch pattern, which is a very simple stitch pattern, um, but I, I knew you know, it would be fine. The textured for this is great because it's knit in pieces, but it's knit, um, it's like knit one row and then knit one purl one, one row. It's called, I knit my mom a big a baby alpaca wrap with that stitch pattern. It was from Pearl Soho. It was just a free pattern. I'll link it um, so you can see what the stitch pattern is. 
it's called like the hedgerow scarf or something. I don't know, it's so simple. It's so easy, there's not a whole lot of purling. It's so great. You can knit it in the round, you can knit it flat, there will be the same gauge because you're just knitting one round anyway. Um, it's just, it's fantastic. Um, yeah, so the bodies work flat from the hem upwards to the high v-neck for extra warmth. Um, yeah, so uh, you knit the back first, then the two front pieces, and then you seam, and I'll show you because I've knit the back and one of the front pieces. Um, you seam the sides together. So this is the back. I knit the back in like one day. Oh my gosh, it was, it went really fast. So I'm using the light color for the hem and the cuffs and the, I'm gonna use it for the collar. And you, so I knit and unraveled this yarn a couple of times and it's quite, it was quite spaghetti-ish. So this is gonna look very different after it's been blocked. It has not been blocked yet. Um, I have some of these little guys at the top. They were just counting some rows. So this is the side I haven't done the front for yet. On this side, I have done the front piece. And so you can see my three needle bind off. They're not sewn together yet. So this is the back and then there's the front piece here. It's very easy to make these identical. Just be sure to count your rows. Um, as long as you know that you do the same number of rows before the armhole bind off, like there's a little armhole bind off here, you're gonna be fine because after that, the, the directions will make sure that you do the same number of rows um, as long as you follow them. Um, and then again, three needle bind off here. There's a, these are curling because they're not blocked, but there is this V-neck edge. So this is the back neck. Let me just do this. Then you can see that the edge kind of goes like that. Really smooth, it's beautiful. It's super nice. So the front looks a little more um, even because it's, um, I didn't use a yarn, a ball that I already knit with and then unraveled. Um, but again, there's gonna be some some really nice um, blocked fabric here. And I am working on, currently, I'm up to the armhole split for the second piece here. You can see they're gonna meet in the middle there. So I'm gonna finish this guy today. And then, um, so I was gonna block it. I was basically gonna do these, do the shoulder um, grafting, and then I was gonna block these three pieces all together. <sighs> And I know I should do that because you should do that before you, you should block it before you pick up stitches or seam anything together. But because these things, pieces are super identical, I might not because I don't really want to because I would rather get as much done on it as I can um, before I go to Florida. This <laughs> When you're watching this, I'll already be back, be back from Florida. Um, so that's great, that's fun, it's hilarious. Um, but I am going to Florida. I'm filming this in advance. Um, going to Florida for a bachelorette, which I mentioned last episode, my best friend from high school is getting married in August and I will be going to Florida with a bunch of my friends, which is, it's really fun when, um, I always think bachelorette is really fun if you're really good friends with all the other bridesmaids. And I know I've met all of them and two of them are my close friends from my high school and one of them is she didn't grow up in our town, but me and the bride and her all knew each other when we were really, really small in preschool. And she's still our close friend. Our families are still friends. And um, our <laughs> uh, our families, her name, uh, the one who didn't grow up in my town, Molly, she, um, the very first yoke sweater I ever made, I gave to Molly. It was a lopey sweater. It was really fun. Um, the second one I gave to Lauren, who's the bride. I have, yeah. And then, um, so Molly's parents and my parents, they don't see each other very often because they were friends when we were in preschool. We went to the same preschool and that's how we met. And, um, but during COVID we were like, let's start this tradition of, Molly still lives in Vermont, of having a, um, a barbecue with our families every summer. So we have a barbecue with our families every summer. Um, that's when I'm home. Last year we did it in early September. Um, and uh, we have like a, a a fire pit in the backyard and we have like s'mores and uh, Molly is gluten-free and we found the best graham crackers in the world that are gluten-free. Like they're way better than honey made graham crackers. They're just like this gluten-free brand. So if you're ever looking for graham crackers and you are gluten intolerant, you should 
check out gluten free graham crackers because I don't know what brand they are, but they're super good. And we got like homemade marshmallows the last time. Oh my gosh, they were so good. That's a total tangent. I'm going to Florida with these girls next week. I'm really excited, but I would like to have as much of this sweater done as possible. So I'm thinking about, I'll probably just mattress stitch these two sides. So basically that's the piece that's not connected yet. This is the, the back side and the front side. I did a nice thick little band. I was afraid of running out. I'm not gonna run out. I'm gonna be totally fine. I have two whole balls left and part of this one. So I'll probably tap into one of these to finish the second front piece. And then it's just the sleeves, which take, sleeves generally take about a third of the total yarn and I will have plenty. And then I've still got plenty of this for the sleeve cuffs and the shawl collar. If I'm really running out, I'll do the shawl collar and this, but based on the yarn specs, I should have plenty of yarn. And I really want to knit this again. Um, like as the pullover, I want to knit it with different stitch patterns. What I think is brilliant about this pattern is that I think you can sub in a lot of patterns. I think you could do it with yarn at different gauges because it's a very plain, simple shape. So you're really just following measurements and you can use stitch counts based on your gauge. So what I always tell people, I'm not, this is the part I have to seam, is like, let's say, okay, so this pattern is 19 stitches over four inches, but let's say you wanna knit this with like a DK weight, you're on at like 23 stitches over four inches. What you just need to do is find, um, for this sweater, you'd go with a half back measurement because a half bust measurement basically, because you're doing it in those, that's the, that's the size of the piece. Like that's the piece you're knitting. You're not doing it in the round. You're doing, you could do it in the round up to the armholes if you wanted, be easy. Um, but uh, it would need seaming and seaming actually gives the garment good structure. So I'm, I'm fine with the seams um, occasionally, as long as there's no purling and not a lot of purling involved. <laughs> um, so let's, okay, yeah. So in that case, I'd say, okay, well, let's say I want the total circumference of my bust to be around 48 inches. What you do, so that means 24 inches back-ish somewhere around there. There's a lot of ease in this sweater, so it's okay if you're a little off. Um, so that means 48 over two, 24, that's how wide you want your back. Um, so then you just say, okay, so the, the gauge for the pattern is ni 19 stitches over four inches, which is, uh, that's 4.75, no, 4 point, yeah, 4.75 stitches over four inches. And let's say you want to do 23, which is 5.75 stitches over four inches. So in that case, you just got to multiply the number of inches by the number of stitches per inch, which like, okay, so that's 24 times however many stitches per inch that is 5.75. And then whatever that number is, I don't have a calculator on hand because I'm filming this on my phone, which is my calculator. You go to the the size with the back stitch count of whatever's closest to that number. So that's a good way to edit this. Again, I'm thinking of doing this like in moss stitch, just for fun, see what happens if I do that. I like to, you know, I like to just do, see what I can do with a pattern to kind of make it um, in a different way, see if the shape works. Again, I think Stella Ackroyd is really smart for, for doing this. Um, it's just, you know, modify patterns. You're not like stealing intellectual property because you don't publish it. You just, you know, you're seeing what you can do. It's a good way to just practice um, modifying a pattern to fit somebody's style or your gauge or the yarn you have, whatever you want. Um, this is a good pattern to do that with because especially the cardigan version, because um, it's just simple and the shapes of the pieces won't be affected by changing a stitch count as much as like a really fitted sweater or like a, yeah, something with a lot of structure and shaping would be. There's very little shaping in this. The only shaping you're doing is the armholes and the V-neck. So that's really cool. And I'm really enjoying it. And again, I, it's one of those things where like I had this yarn for so long and I would, I would sit there, I would feel it. It's super, um, it's just so wooly and and lovely um and it's yeah i love it i it's, i can't get enough of it and uh i really wanted to have something beautiful with this yarn because it's it's like a, it's 
just so drapey and so pretty and I like cardigans. I like wearing a cardigan over like a t-shirt. It just has a layering piece. I have a cardigan, my first cardigan I ever made. It was also in pieces. I didn't set the shoulder in very well on one of the sleeves, um, but it's brown and it's super wool. I made it, made it with Cascade Eco wool, which is kind of bulky. It's like bulky, uh, Aaron-ish. And I made it and it lives in my office. It has really fun green buttons on it. And I wear it all the time at work. If I'm cold, I just throw it on. So I would like to have a sweater to just kind of, yeah, just a layering piece. Monica, my best knitting friend who gave me the Titus yarn, Byron U Titus, she made me a cardigan for my birthday a few years ago that was really nice. And it was made with wool stock worsted, blue sky wool stock worsted, it's cabled. It's so nice. Just stitch definition scores. Monica's a beautiful knitter, a beautiful knitter. Um, and it's just, I love it. I love it so much, so. I kind of feel like I need to make more cardigans. And this is a great piece. I'll probably make one of these for Jordan, my third roommate who doesn't knit. Um, Hannah wants to make one. Hannah's my roommate who does knit. She wants to make one of these because she wants to sit. She wants to do a cardigan with no steaks. She's not ready to steak yet. And uh, she and I both don't really like purling. <laughs> so some people like purling, but it tends to be a thing that people don't like purling. So if you don't really like purling, you're not alone. I don't mind ribbing, I actually don't. Um, I feel like I get into a rhythm of ribbing. It's like purling a whole row that I don't like. So like I'll add steaks to a cardigan. If it's back and forth, I'll just knit it flat. I'll just knit in the round and add a steak, no problem. As long as the yarn's woolly. I mean, you can do a steak with the superwash yarn. You just have to be really careful about crocheting the edges instead of can't needle felt that because it won't felt it's super wash yarn. This wouldn't felt great either. This long wall, not gonna felt super well. Um, so yeah, be careful with, if you're making a steak. Um, so yeah, I think it'll be nice. Again, I'm gonna sew those seams. I hope this is the, just YouTube just makes this the, the shot. <laughs> and then I'm gonna do the little sleeves and you probably won't see me wearing this until the fall because it's getting hot. One of the reasons I like that this is a piece that you do in pieces is that um, you don't have to have the whole sweater on your lap. Although as soon as I finished that and I joined it all, I had to pick up the sleeves. So I don't think I talked about that. Um, to do that, you these are gonna be joined. That's all gonna be a seam and there's gonna be this hole here and that's where the sleeve's gonna go. Well, that's pretty big. It's a nice big sleeve. Like you can use a... 16 inch needle for most of the sleeve probably there will be tapering eventually i'll probably have to go to magic loop but that's fine um and uh yeah you pick up all those stitches around that that hole carefully i will probably be picking up through the knit stitches yeah i tend to do that um that'll be fun and yeah knit those sleeves finish with this guy and then it's just the um the, the button band i haven't decided on the buttons for this yet i gotta check on what i have i have this um tendency to use not enough buttons uh, if you've seen some of my videos where i have cardigans on uh oftentimes i only i don't have enough buttons and there's like these big gaping holes and so i'm determined to put the right number of buttons on this one so we'll see if i can manage that might have to mix and match a little bit See what I've got in my collection. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's uh, that's that. Again, this, like, I feel like I was waiting. I think I didn't finish that thought. I was waiting for like the perfect thing to, sh to show up in my head for this yarn. And then I cannot stop. I am rarely a monogamous knitter, really, really rarely. But I started this, um, this is a Saturday when I'm recording this. I started this on Thursday, no, Wednesday night at like 10.30. I did the back hem, this long back hem piece. I did the back hem that night. The next day, I mean, I was working from home that day, but I was working all, I mean, like I was working from home, so I probably knit during lunch and I would like, I knit for, I always knit for two, three hours in the morning before I go to work, especially if I work from home, I can get up at like 6.30 and just start knitting and I can, you know, knit until about 9.30 and then I, we, you know, work. Um, but I also do a lot of student meetings and so, I'll be like, you know, most of my afternoon is just taken up like on the Google Meet with students and I 
have to kind of like, you know, you have to prep, like get the, get the profile advising profile up. And then you have to talk, like you get on the call and usually wait between five and 10 minutes for the student to show up in the meeting room. You talk to them. I do sort of this advising. That's quite, um, I, I do a variety of advising, but it's like a regular meeting. We talk a lot. They're in programs where they get a lot of advising. So I, I see them all the time. We chat about how things are going. It's been finals recently. So we're mostly just chatting about that, making sure things are okay. All their fall classes are all set. And then, um, and then they log off and I write notes. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's definitely like downtime, a little bit of downtime in between when I finish the notes and when the next student shows up for the meeting. So you get a lot done. I always I put it down when I'm talking to the student because you have to look at them. You have to write stuff down. I would never knit if a student was in my office or on a Zoom with a student. But, um, and then if you have like a meeting, I, if I have like a meeting where I'm not responsible for all of the material and I just have to like do my part and then I listen to other people talk, I do like knit on those. Um, usually I just knit my um, my office socks. I have self-striping sock here in my office and I knit office. What's that called? My office socks. I don't wear them in the office. I just knit them at the office. <laughs> um, but I did knit on this on the back of this and I just like tore through it and finished the back, I think before kickball on Thursday, I'm on a kickball team. We won our first game on Thursday. It was so exciting. And then, uh, and then yesterday I did the front piece. This piece took about half as long because it's about half as big at less than half because there's a V-neck. So there was more decreases. Um, it's just speedy. It's really the yarn. I'm using a size six needle, so it just kind of flies. It seems to be, this seems to be the right stitch pattern for this pattern, this this type of wool. It works really well. So I urge you to try single breeds to see what you like about them, what you don't like about them. Find the gauge that works for you. Find a pattern that's at that gauge so that you don't have to do a whole lot of modifications if you don't want to, unless you're used to that, in which case obviously modify away. Um, but yeah, I'm going to finish this piece and do some mattress stitch work up the side and then start the sleeves. That's my project for the rest of the day. I did a lot of cleaning today. Yeah, I did a lot of cleaning, did some errands, went to Target, got a whole bunch of useful things. Um, you always go to Target and there's like a list of things you need and you get all of them if you're lucky and they have everything and you can find everything. And then there's like five to 10 things that you didn't realize you needed that you have to get. And it's always a lot more expensive than you think. I didn't grow up with a Target, so Target is still like so incredible to me. It's like the most amazing place on earth. Um, so yeah, I got, um, got some fun sandals. I got a basket for my knitting in the living room so that it's all in a nice place and it's not just in bags scattered everywhere. Um, yeah, got some stuff for cleaning. We got a new pizza cutter. Our pizza cutter was not great and I make pizza. I try to make pizza once a week. My mom was a always a big pizza, is still a big pizza person. Um, and she has like tried to, she's worked on pizza for like 30 years since she, my dad and my mom have been married for 32 years this year. And they got a pizza stone from her friend Barb for their wedding. And since they got married, my mom has been making pizza. And uh, so she's a pizza stone. Then she got a pizza steel a few years ago and she got me a pizza steel this year for Christmas. Um, Cause I got, I have this new place and I have a nice, a really nice kitchen here. And I have, I'm in the time of my life where it's like, okay, I'm gonna be living, like I stopped living in the dorm and then with that family that I was nannying for, love them. Um, that was a great year, never forget. Um, but I do now have my own kitchen. So it's like, so I have, now I have a pizza steel and a pizza peel and then the book that my mom uses, which is called The Elements of Pizza. I'll link that, it's great. But the steel is like a pizza stone, but it's a really, really thin piece of steel. And it's pretty big. It's as big as a pizza, basically. And it's so heavy. It's like 50 pounds. Um, and it just sits in your oven. You never have to move it. It basically what it does is it's like a pizza stone. It um it um makes the heat. What's that word that I'm looking for? But it like it spreads it out. And so you can cook, you can just leave it in your oven and it will uh, 
properly um, circulation i don't know is that the right word it heats up and then stuff gets heated more th thoroughly um more evenly there's like even heating with a steel plate on in your oven so uh, we leave it in the oven and everything cooks better um and it's super cool um yeah so that so basically it's like you know the stone you you turn the oven on to as high as it can go usually 500 or 550 and you heat up the stone for like an hour so we heat up the steel for like an hour and then we put the pizza in and uh i prefer my favorite pizza my best pizza personally <laughs> is the uh, focaccia pizza that you don't even have to need it's great um but um I did make, two weeks ago, I made pizza pizza, like actual pizza with the peel. I used the peel for the first time. And the the um, pizza, like I put it, I, I put it on the peel to like put the ingredients on, right on the peel. And I, which is the wood thing that you use to get it in and out of the oven. And it, um, it slid perfectly well before I put anything on it. But then once I, um, once I, it was all heavy with like, to be fair, I think I stretched it too thin and there was like a lot of cheese on it. And we, all three of us, don't hate me, all three of us in my house, me and my two roommates, we all like pineapple on our pizza. Um, and so we were making like a Hawaiian pizza with ham and pineapple. It was really good. And except the pineapple was frozen and we didn't thaw it. And so it was just covered in ice and it was very heavy. It also made the pizza very wet because the ice then melted. Um, so the crust was, it's, it was tasted fine. It wasn't like tough or anything, but it was like, everything was kind of wet. And I was like, why is this so wet? Um, and it was because the pineapple was covered in ice and it like, it melts. So thaw your pineapple, thaw stuff before you put it on pizza. If it's full of ice, if it's not like coated in the ice, I guess it's okay. But anyway, um, and it was really hard to slide off the peel and like a bunch of pineapple got like came off on the steel and stuck to it and I have to clean it. But, um, I might... I think I'm gonna make that kind of pizza again tomorrow because usually Sunday is pizza night. Um, and uh, I have to make the dough tonight because I'm gonna use my mom's famous old pizza recipe that she's been using for, oh, well, she's perfected it over the years, but I try, I usually try the elements of pizza doughs. I like to try them to go through them just to, you know, um, to try them out. But uh, Hers is really good and it, she has to make it the night before because it's like slowly fermented. Fermented. I don't have a proper dough tub. I need that too, like a six quart dough tub. We have a big um, bowl that it's, the lid's not airtight, but it. Um, I really want those silicone, the, the airtight lid bowls that my mom has from Costco, but I can never find them. Anyway, my parents are coming to visit in a couple weeks. They show up here the day I get back from the bachelorette party. One week, oh my gosh, that's really soon. Um, they're coming when their semester ends. And so I should tell my mom to bring me some from Costco because <laughs> she has a membership. And uh, a dough tub, look at all the things that I need. Please bring them to me. You haven't been to my house before. You can be my house warm present. No, I'm just kidding. Hi, mom. <laughs> my mom watches sometimes. I think she watches like far back like she doesn't she's not like caught up but i think she watches them sometimes she comments <laughs> hi mom uh my most loyal viewers are like a few of my friends and people i don't know thank you all but yeah uh that's my pizza story the elements of pizza is my pizza book this is my sweater <laughs> i again I, this is like what a lot of podcasters do. They podcasters. I always say that and it's not, I'm not a podcaster. This is not a podcast. Podcasts are audio only, but the knitting community seems to call videos podcasts. So I guess this is a knitting podcast. Um, I prefer to call it a channel. This is my channel where I talk about knitting and random stuff like pizza <laughs> and my students and how I, I don't talk about, I would never talk about my students. I talk about how my meetings work <laughs> with students. It's almost the end of the semester. So excited. By the time you see this, it will be the over. The semester will be over. I think this is posted the last day of final exams for us. So I don't have to take any finals or grade any finals, but it does feel like, you know, you still, like I've said probably before, you feel the ebb and flow of the academic year. And it's really nice to kind of have the variety in the work. And you always get so excited when the students come back in the fall. Fun. Um, but I work with students in the summer too. 
there's summer programs that we have. Um, so I'm lucky I get to work with them. Yeah, so I think that's all. I'm just rambling now. I'm just talking about random stuff. Um, but yeah. I was talking about kitchen equipment. Yeah, I have. A, I also have a KitchenAid stand mixer that I got for my birthday because my birthday is very close to Thanksgiving. And my mom got me a stand mixer because it was half off at Target for Black Friday. And so I have a KitchenAid five quart stand mixer um, that was like 200 bucks. And so if you need a KitchenAid, get it on Black Friday because, and it's like Robin's egg blue, it's so nice. Um, I also have my mom's Cuisinart. She got a new Cuisinart, which is why she gave me this one, but this one didn't stop working. I don't know why she got the new Cuisinart. Mom, why did you get a new Cuisinart? I don't know. Maybe it had more stuff like attachments. She has a fancy new one. She gave me her old one. It's 30 years old, it's older than me, and it still works perfectly. She got a new blade for it. There's a few attachments that I have for it, but I only ever use the blade. I know you can like grate cheese with one of the attachments. I've never done that. I'm sure that would be super cool. I should use that for pizza cheese, but I don't. Um, yeah, I just use the regular blade. It's super nice and it works great. And my brother got me a really nice um, stick blender that has like several attachments. It has like a attachment for like chopping stuff. Like it's like a tiny stand, you know, a tiny, tiny Cuisinart. And it has like a whisk attachment so I can make whipped cream because I don't, the only thing I still don't have is a hand mixer. Um, and we also don't have a toaster oven. I really want that. But otherwise we have a lot of gadgets. People are always really impressed and I say, with all the things like the gadgets and I'm like, yeah, well, I was really determined. I have like a list of things that I wanted to have by, in my kitchen by the time I was 30 and I'm ahead of schedule because I'm 28. <laughs> so, um, you hear that squeaking? Those are my new sandals from Target <laughs> that I got. They're just slides that I got because um, someone in my office has office slides and I wanted to have, I have, those are like Croc Birkenstocks. They're not made by Crocs. They're made by Birkenstocks, but they're like rubber. They're, they're like the similar material to Crocs, like the styrofoam. And I got them last year and they're disgusting. Like they're so, they got so gross in just one year, the styrofoam Birkenstocks, but they're so good. They're like, it's like flip-flops, but they don't hurt your toes and they don't come off. Like they're just Arizona Birkenstocks, but they're made out of like styrofoam and they're only like 40 bucks and you can get them at Dick's Sporting Goods, which I tell everyone and everybody thinks that I am an advertisement. And I'm like, no, I just really like these sandals and I think everyone should get them. And mine are like, a, they're the same color. Actually, Jordan pointed this out yesterday. They're the same color as this lavender lineup book. Jordan loves these because she's a graphic designer and she thinks that they're the most beautiful layout books. They are, they're so gorgeous. You can see this one's got a nice water stain on it. Um, but I have all of them. I don't have the brand new one that just came out, line of 14, yet. Because I haven't been to a knitting store since that came out. And I just spent a ton of money at Target today, so I have to be calm for the next little while. Um, but, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I think that's it. This is long. Sorry. It's a long one. But, that fell. Excuse me. When's the damn long one? It says 1077781 is the shade number, lot 17. Cool. Okay, I'm going to work on this. I'm done. Oh, yeah. It's almost 3 o'clock. It's time to get some knitting done. So thank you for watching. This has been Tiny Desk Knitting with Emma. Bye!